Hi. Hello. Sorry. <laughs> Welcome to a special Friday night um, talk. There we go. Friday night fireside chat chat with artistic instigator Celine Song and our esteemed panel. My name is Gavin, rhymes with Raven, he, him, his, and I'm the community engagement associate at New York Theater Workshop. So welcome. We're broadcasting this talk from Zoom and simultaneously live streaming on Facebook. Hello. <laughs> and we are so happy to have you all here. Before we start, um, I would just like to give a few words. New York Theater Workshop has long sought to create art that interrogates our past as a way to, of understanding the present and shining light toward the future. To that end, we are taking the time to recognize the history of the land we occupy in the East Village. And as we find ourselves in the digital space, we'd like to embrace this opportunity to acknowledge the many native lands from which we're all tuning in. We are posting a link in the chat where you can learn about the tribal history of the land on which you are situated. So we invite everyone to take a moment, input your address into the website and post in the chat the native land from which you are joining us. New York Theater Workshop is situated on the island of Manhattan and we acknowledge the island as the traditional lands of the Munsi and the Lenape, the Canarsie, the Uncachog, the Madding Acock, the Shinnecock, the Rigawank, and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Thank you. This panel is part of New York Theater Workshop's virtual programming series, which is all free and available to the entire New York Theater Workshop community, including you. So if you are in the position to do so, we hope you would consider making a donation in honor of this conversation to Broadway for Racial Justice and also to support uh, New York Theater Workshop's ongoing programming. Just a little bit of Broadway for Racial Justice. It's an organization fighting for racial justice and equity by providing immediate resources, assistance, and amplification for BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, POC in the Broadway um, and theatrical community at large. In doing so, they help cr create safe spaces throughout the theater community for creativity and artistry to thrive. And you will find the link to donate for, to both organizations in the chat, on Zoom, and in the comments on Facebook Live. Awesome. So let's play theater makers about gaming. So this conversation will last around an hour and we'll open up for Q and A for about the last 20 to 15 minutes. When we get to the Q and A portion, just feel free to share your questions for the panelists via the Q and A feature on Zoom or comments on Facebook Live. And we'll do our best to get all of the questions that we can in the time we have. So I'll start inviting up our panelists. First is Dave Harris. Dave is a poet and playwright from West Philly. He is a Tau playwright in residence at Roundabout Theater Company. His play Tombo and Bones will be produced at Playwrights Horizon and Center Theater Group and his play Exception to the Rule will be produced at Roundabout in the vague future. So Dave, come on board. Hey, Thanks. wait, uh, hold up. There it is. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Hi. What up? The next person that we're going to invite um, with us here on Zoom is C.A. Johnson. C.A. Johnson is a Brooklyn-based playwright originally from um, Metairie, Louisiana. Her plays include All the Natalie Portmans, Thirst, um, um, All the Natalie Portmans, MCC Theater, Thirst, a 2017 Kilroy's List, The Climb, Cherry Lane Mentor Project, An American Feast, NYU Playwrights Horizon Theater School, and I Know, I Know, I Know. Most recently, she was a Tau playwright in residence at MCC Theater. Come on, CA, join us. There What's we up? go. Hey. Hey. Next, we're going to bring up Max Yu. Max is a first generation Chinese American playwright from the San Francisco Bay Area, who is now based in Shanghai. He is the recipient of the 2019 Relentless Award for his play, Night Watch and has participated in the New South Young Playwrights Festival at Horizon Theater. Welcome, Max. There we go. Yo. Uh, 
And finally, I would like to welcome Celine Song. Celine Song's play Endlings received its world premiere in 2019 at American Repertory Theater and had its New York premiere in 2020 at New York Theater Workshop. It has been named a finalist for the 2020 Susan Smith Blackburn Prize. Celine, come join us. Hi. Uh, there you go. <laughs> Hi. There <it> is. <laughs> I'm stoked that we're all here. Yes. And what brings us together is that we're all gamers and we're all theater makers. <laughs> and this is a this is a moment. I feel like something that Celine has mentioned in conversation is that. This is the moment during the pandemic that theater makers have slowly started coming out as gamers. <laughs> so, I wanted to go around and just ask each, um, each panelist, what was the most influential game you played when you were younger? Or maybe, you know, in the earlier part of your experience of gaming, and what are you playing now? So for me, something uh, that moved me, I, when I was five, I had a Sega Genesis. And I was all about that Sonic because, you know, <laughs> Sega. But then I think something that was the most influential for me was weirdly, like when I went to PC, it was, it, it, it was a Roller Coaster Tycoon. I really went through <laughs> one, two, three, and deluxe. Like the, the <laughs> and, um, but right now what I'm doing is uh, I'm, I'm now in virtual reality. I have an Oculus and so I'm in the world. It's it's wild. I, I attend theater on on my Oculus, <laughs> um, and I'll pass it on to CA. Uh, let's see. Uh, I feel like the first game I remember playing when I was young is probably Mortal Kombat Two on Super Nintendo. Um, sort of remember though. I think the most influential was probably Super Smash Brothers in '64. Um, that was just the jam. I will, if somebody has it to this day, I don't own it, but I'm like, oh, you have to Smash Brothers? Excuse me. And then they don't exist to me anymore. Um, these days, so I'm pretty, I'm mostly on Xbox these days. I just started using Steam, which is pretty fun, but, um, I'm mostly on Xbox and I'm mostly playing Sims, if I'm being honest. Sims, and I was for a minute playing this game called Outer Wilds, which is the coolest thing I've ever played in my life, but it's really hard. So I'm taking a break from it. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you like to pass it on to CA? Uh, I'll pass it on to Dave. Um, I, I, work, I have to figure out how to separate like the game that's been like the most influential and the game that I've sunk the most of my life into. Uh, <laughs> those are not the same thing. Um, the game that probably like, really kind of set me on was probably, um, probably true for a lot of people, Ocarina of Time on N64. Um, like that was one that like my mom and I would like stay up until 4 a.m. and then she would let me skip school the next day so we'd keep playing in the morning. Um, and, like, she was very big on like as long as your grades are good and you're doing your work you can like take a, take a day whenever you need to so we would just like take days play video games um, and Ocarina of Time was the first one for that. Um, right now <sighs> I, it's, right now, I've just been playing a lot of like battle royale games, like a lot of like Apex Legends. Um, was deep into Overwatch for a while, and then I had to get out because it was it was it was too much. Um, <laughs> like, I've been playing a lot of the games that like, you just do the same thing over and over again, and like at some point you question like what it's doing to you. But <laughs> then you keep playing, and I'm I'm playing way too much Apex. Pass <laughs> <laughs> um, on to Max. Hey. Uh... Now the first game I remember clearly playing was like I was six years old and my uncle gave me this bootleg Chinese copy of Pokemon Crystal and you couldn't even save the game actually. And I just could not read Chinese at the time and I was like, what is going on? Um, I went to the first gym leader, but that was the first game I played. But the most influential, I would say is probably this MMORPG called Maple Story. Yeah, I was really big on Maple Story. I, I saw <laughs> way too many way too much of my life on that game <laughs> and i guess I'd pass it on let's uh pass it on to selena. Yeah, selena yeah um well i feel like i was playing uh like i think that the first like pc thing that i did was like minesweeper like you know you know like though like that old that kind of an old school thing but i feel like the game that i've distinctly remember like playing 
uh, for real is uh, Simcopter. Mm. It's like a helicopter game from like the guys who make the make Sims. And um, the way that I played it was so weird and social because like I didn't trust myself to navigate horizontally, but I only vertically. So my <laughs> sister who literally took charge of uh, navigating the helicopter horizontally. <laughs> <laughs> and I would just control the elevation. So anyway, so it was something like that. And then I remember like Halo being a really big game for me uh, for, uh, for, uh, for a long time. And then like uh, on the other side of something like that, I played like Princess Maker. Like, I don't know if you guys remember this stupid game. Horrible. Princess Maker, Princess Maker 2 is really where it was at. <laughs> it, was like, it was like Princess Maker like 6, right? So, but my, my, the one that I played was Princess Maker 2, which is really, really complicated because you play a father who has adopted this daughter and you're trying to turn her into a princess and it's like a little medieval, but you basically like send her to class and like make her do uh, like part-time jobs. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But the, <laughs> recently, <laughs> recently I've been playing, um, I feel like I play Overwatch every day, Dave. So I need to, first of all, I need to know, Dave, like what, uh, skill rating you ever reached, like what your peak was, <laughs> and also, also I need to know what your main is. But that's the, that's it, yeah. And, like, and what, like what role you prefer, yeah. And there was a moment I did play Apex as well, but I think I wasn't good enough at aim for me to be good at that. And at the moment, I'm contemplating. And and recently, I played Animal Crossing for a while until like my sister sort of stopped playing uh, it. It, and then the town just became like me only town and I was less motivated to make it nice. Anyway, but the, sorry, the most recent thing that I've been thinking about getting is Crusader Kings 3, which I've never played, but it looks cool. Yeah, sorry, I took, I took a long time talking about this. No, not at all, this is awesome. <laughs> took me forever. <laughs> and I, I think you could see like in, in the comment section, people are shouting out, we have gamers in the audience who are just shouting out the games and like, affirming like i did that too i did that too i did that too um maple store got a lot of shout outs <laughs> yeah i'm really proud of that Helicopter one like game. thank you maple story yeah. <laughs> and and for those and and you know and maybe some of our audience members for the first time they're stepping into the world of gaming and i guess one of the things i just want to you know like to make them aware of like we well, like everyone else uh, everyone in this room right now zoom room we grew up with gaming the way we describe is from our childhood. And so in the past 40 years, even before we started playing 40, 50 years, gaming has turned into an art form in which there's sophisticated storytelling, um, cinematography, <laughs> um, different genres of playing. I think in what we were talking about, we had uh, first person shooters, we're talking about competitive gaming, we're talking about life simulation, um, MMO, RPGs, um, multiplayer online, you meet a lot of people, social, social games. Um, and so it runs the gamut. Like the world of gaming and the internet together have truly created its own language, its own commerce, its own communities. And so for us, it's not, it's, it's part of who we are and the way that we see the world. And I'm kind of stoked to know how it's influenced you as artists. I don't think there's a way to separate it. And I think, um, it's very interesting to talk about because we don't get to talk about it. We're all just coming out of the closet um, as gamers. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I'm also queer, so I, you know, why can I? <laughs> but uh, I, I guess as, let's, uh, as, our, as theater makers, do you remember a moment in the past of a theater experience in which you just stopped and said, that's a gaming thing. Um, I, I, I was just thinking about uh, playing games and being sort of having my foot in gaming culture in general. I think that my tolerance for boredom is very uh, low. I just mean when it comes to like, just because I know the mindset of like that, am that amount of stimulus, like that much happening, like, and that kind of, uh, the fluidity of storytelling sometimes that I feel like I'm a little less like, uh, I don't know. I find myself being a little less uh, concerned about 
is it too much? I feel like I end up thinking like, well, on Overwatch, you're looking at like 15 different elements at any given moment. Everybody's brain is capable of that. So I am, it makes me feel like less worried about like how people are going to uh, encounter something that is like fragmented, you know, something like that. But what do you guys, what do you guys think? I feel like for me, a lot of it is just, because I've, I've been thinking about like, sort of like a what in storytelling, what storytelling in video games kind of had, have moved me the most. And like a lot of it has kind of been through like, like Mass Effect or like, like Telltale games in like a way where like, it really like a lot of it, a lot of the storytelling for me just came through understanding like wish fulfillment a lot. <laughs> um, and like how um, much of my way of moving through those games was through kind of, uh, both like very much simpler relationships and also like how much I love the task of like managing relationships in a video game, you know? Um, and like that for me sort of, like, I mean, it's the, 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 the simple version of just like be like, oh, like the idea of fantasy, but like also like largely just like being in a space where like you're not bound to like truth and you're more just bound to like uh, wishes and like your impulses in a certain way, you know? Um, and like particularly like open world games where you can just sort of like try a thing and see what the hell happens. Um, and so sort of like that same impulse, like translating that into theater. Yeah, it's kind of like that impulse. Yeah, because like I play so many MRPGs and just always knowing that I can just like do whatever because that's such a great freedom. And I, I, I can't like, I can try to think of like specific examples, but I guess I can't. But just, yeah, it's more just like an impulse of just like being able to explore. Like that's just really affecting me. But I think I also just think about like language, like, I also can't think of a specific example, but sometimes I see in theater or I just even when I'm doing my own kind of stuff, like I just, I feel like video games, the language of video games, especially when you're talking to people, like if you're playing Apex Legends or whatever, or if you're playing like into an MORPG, like people talk in a really specific way. Like, I mean, I guess you call it like internet language. I don't know what that is, but you know, they, they talk in a certain way, the kind of urgency or just like specific words that they use. And, some of that I just see in theater, or like I, I would like to see that in theater. Yeah, I, um, I, I like a lot of um, sort of storytelling puzzly games, you know, like uh, Going Home or Where is Edith Finch or things like that, where you're walking into a space with mystery and the point is that you walk through and try to figure out what happened, what went wrong. Where is everybody? Like these sort of long form, uh, I just call them puzzles. Um, and every so often, I feel like my favorite plays do that or plays that I at least go structurally, I'm really into this. Um, and I feel like, what did I see? Uh, Blue Ridge at Atlantic last year. Mm -hmm. They did that play like, you're following this story and everybody's in front of you making choices, but you're watching one character the whole time being like, what happened to you? <laughs> like you spend the whole play being like, but for real, what happened? And like the end of the play is literally her being like, this happened to me. And she still doesn't name it, but finally you like know why you were on the trip. And that feels like those kinds of games to me. And they're also my favorite games. So it makes complete sense that like, those are my favorite plays. I like the same ride where everybody's agreed to be there, but they're like, what's going on? Like, nobody <laughs> knows what's going on. <laughs> like, yeah. If that's happening in a play or a game, I'm like, I dig this, this I can do. <laughs> before, before I throw in my example, Max, can you just uh, just give the definition for MMORPG? Oh, yeah. What is it? Multi, multi, massive. oh no. Yes. So, sorry, <laughs> yeah, massive, massively multiplayer online role-playing game yeah it's that thing where yeah it's there's a bunch of people like thousands all in the online world and you just like talk to them or you don't talk to them and do your own thing <laughs> i always turn off my mic <laughs> but but I, have to, I think uh for me i think the first time it kind of hit me that gaming was was changing the aesthetic of theater was when I went to see, whether or not they did it consciously I, it's a, is a question, but the way they sold it when they moved it to the US was a sleep no more. So before mm -hmm. I moved to New York, they sold it in, in Boston with American Repertory Theater as a show for gamers. Mm -hmm. And that's how Diane Paulus always called it. And it didn't make sense to me until I went in and talking about like, you know, open world, like adventures and choosing where you want to go. 
it was truly the detail of what you can do. And also you're wearing a mask and you're, you're basically in, in like a multiplayer online yeah. game in which you're not talking to anyone. <laughs> well, I mean, I wonder about that because I wonder about the, I wonder about the safety of uh, the physical literal space mm. versus the safety of, you know what I mean? A video game where you literally cannot physically do certain things, mm. right? Like if you're, if it's if you, your game doesn't have a way to murder someone, you can't, right? <laughs> like, if, if if you prevent them from like phys- not being able to physically destroy something, like you can't. But in real life, I don't know. I, I think that's what made me feel so stressed out and sleep no more. As someone who like, <laughs> you know what I mean? I felt like the control was not there in a way but, that like. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, sorry. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. But I, I think it's like in a weird way, like a video game, you, you enter a certain room because the actors are waiting. They're waiting for a cue or it's like, it's like queuing a cut scene, like in an epic, like in like, yeah. It, it, can I, I'm going to throw in another example. If that's okay. I don't yeah. know if anyone caught this. It's called, uh, it was a play by Aya Ohm. Oh, oh, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to mispronounce someone's name. Um, Ayogawa who mm-hmm. is, shout out, a former 2050 fellow of New York U Workshop, but <laughs> uh, wrote a five, five, six years ago, a play called Ludic Proxy, which is like, Ludic Proxy is the idea that you die in a game and you relive and re- you're reborn and you just keep mm-hmm. going. And every, every scene, there's only three scenes and three main scenes in this play, the first one, and they're all about nuclear disaster and climate change. <laughs> the first one, um, uses first like takes a house and they use mini cameras and goes through the house and projects as if it's a first person shooter and the characters literally literally play a video game the second act was almost like a tale t- t- uh, tall tale t- telltale mm-hmm. game in which all of the all of the um the audience members had panels and so they had to vote and decide um mm-hmm. how a character survives a nuclear disaster whoa and so it's asking about the ethical point does she leave her sister in this town and run for it or does she stay and in the way that they did the project the projections was just like a video game is as and the way that they di- she directed um the actors they walked in the space as if they were in final fantasy and like these <laughs> weird like <laughs> angles and like the sitting position, it was, it was brilliant. And I think the third one, they, yeah, it's the third one, they explored VR. So those are the, like, that was a show in which I was like, oh, this is so explicitly using the language of gaming. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I yeah. I <laughs> the things that we can do. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. Mm. There is something stressful about like free will in that way though. I was thinking about what, thinking about what you said with like sleep no more versus like a video game and sort of like the like illusion of control that they give you when everything's like pre- so measured out versus like when you're in an actual like a devised piece like that and it's like oh you could actually I mean not that you like like when they sort of get like it's like in a game like Grand Theft Auto or something where like it's meant for you to kind of like feel like you can go on or do do terrible things that you would never do in real life versus like in a piece where you like have the freedom to move around like what I don't know I guess I always kind of wonder like what like sort of that illusion of free, free will does to you I don't know I was playing Red Dead Redemption 2 recently and I found that like I had a new relationship to violence where like I couldn't play because like I didn't want to shoot people oh. <laughs> and nothing, like, had ever That's happened tough. to me as a kid as a kid I was like oh no like I'm doing this mission and like why am I like shooting so many like which it was just like this weird thing where I was just like, oh, what's, what's shifting in my relationship to like control in reality or in this game? Well, but the brilliance of that game too, right, is by the end, it makes you ask that question. Like yeah. that the writers were like, no, 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 you're going to have to face this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, but the, you get but to I, the end and you're like, oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so moving. I mean, but one, I remember like thinking like, uh, feeling like I I was like so dumb for not thinking that this could be a, a way to tell a story, which is like that amazing thing that happens with the redemption where you're calling out, you you get yourself drunk, your character is drunk, and you're trying to call out the name of the, you're trying to find your friend, 
and his name, I forget his name, his name is like David or something, but like you walk around and there's an interact button and then the way that that friend's name is spelled is different um, anytime, because you're drunk and anytime that that person isn't really the right person. And the mean, meanwhile, everybody at this bar that, that you're trying to find the friend in, uh, their face looks like the friends. So you're drunk, so you're walking around and you're, it's hard to navigate and then you sort of get to a random person, like a like random like woman standing there and then the face is that of your friend and you're like, baby? But it's like, but it would be like spelled badly, right? So you know it's the wrong person. So that's, and then you're just stumbling around being like, David? But I just remember feeling like, I don't know, that just felt, I don't know, Red Dead Redemption is so good. That's all I'm trying to say. I guess. <laughs> don't you think? I don't know. But, but Dave, so, sorry, one second. Uh, but one, one question was, Dave, so you were saying that because of how good the violence was, you felt at one point like, yeah. Not even, not even because of how good, like, I, I don't, like, I, like, like, the first game I ever played was, like, also Mortal Kombat, you know, so it wasn't, like, the, <laughs> the, like, the violence of it. It was, it, it, it was, like, how it was, um, I guess this is, like, a thing with, like, video games where you just, like, selectively, like, put in someone's persona, and when that persona is crafted really well, like, then you're, like, having to deal with the consequences of doing that. So I was, like, oh, I just robbed a bank on horseback, I'm feeling like a G, and now here comes, like, a hundred cops, and I have to shoot them all in the head, and, like, suddenly... I don't know, I don't, I, and it was just this weird thing where I was playing where I was just like, oh, I don't know. I, I, it's a similar controversy of like Last of Us 2, where it was like, mm. now we're like dealing with the consequences of like, you have control and yet also you're playing a character and yet also something about me desires to be in this character and thus mm. I'm gonna kill a bunch of people, you know? Like, and, and, and it, it feels like tied to what you're saying about like, oh, when they, when they make you feel drunk and like you're seeing faces and like, the game is manipulating you so clearly such that you can't even find another way out, but also it makes sense because you're drunk and you can't find your friend, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's such a good game. Yeah. And I haven't beaten it yet. <laughs> <laughs> you're all saying is like games are so sophisticated in storytelling and then with, similar to theater, how well they craft the character. You actually have the sensory like um experience of what the characters are feeling within their worlds and i think that's like brilliant and it's really hard yeah it, it, it's the only other place i've had that experience is theater mm, yeah i think it's uh it's dread i think that's what the feeling is i think it's like um because I, I I feel like I'm drawn to I'm drawn to horror. I've always been drawn to horror like my whole life. It's probably my like home genre. The first play I ever saw was The Innocence, which is literally the turn of the screw. Like, and I think um, video games have mastered, you know, giving you a universe and being like, have fun. <laughs> you start having fun, and you're like, what's gonna, what is gonna happen? And I feel like that's like the lifeblood of theater. And not that it's not with movies, of course it is, but it, um, the structure is so much more clear in film because you know, like every time it's gonna be the three acts and it's gonna do the thing. And it's very rare that they don't. And even then you gotta be like watching some kind of indie something. So it's like, I feel like with theater and with gaming, like there's so much possibility that it's like actively terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. like it's weird that I play The Sims and I'll be like, I gotta make sure to feed that baby because if I don't, <laughs> and like, <laughs> you know, like I don't know what I like get, and it it does it fills me with dread. I'm like, oh, it's Christmas or whatever Winterfest, whatever they call it, and I'm like, I gotta make sure everyone has a good Winterfest, yeah. and I'm stressed <laughs> about them like eating the meal, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter, but the way they've sort of giving me the ability to choose mm -hmm. makes it matter so much more. And I think it is that sort of free will thing. And I know that like, not all plays give you that, but you did choose to sit down and play make-believe. Mm -hmm. And like that choice leads to dread because you literally were like, here's some money. I'm gonna go watch people lie. <laughs> um, and it's gonna be so good. And like, you're just agreeing to be tortured. I think it's a similar thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I, I was th I was thinking about how like how you play the game reveals so much about who you are, and I think on a mm -hmm. level that uh, that's very different, like uh, th you know, a level that isn't usually revealed. Like I feel like, for example, like CA, you and I, when we're playing Sims, the way that we 
the things that excite us about Sims and the, the way I prioritize certain things and you don't prioritize those things, you just prioritize something else. Like that, I bet that if we were to really compare to notes, we would just realize how different we are as human beings. And I think good theater does that, right? Good theater makes you go like, um, uh, theater that I feel like has an impact is, some, is something that you watch and then like five people walk in and they all come out learning, having realized something new about themselves, right? Um, but I feel like video games, it's like just the way that I play it. Like, yeah, like in Sims, like I don't, I have never decorated a home. And I know for a lot of people play Sims for the home, right? I have, ne I have always bought it furnished and I just have never given a shit about adding any decoration. And I know that's, mm -hmm. anyway, yeah, that's what you'll see. When You're hurting I my feelings. <laughs> hurting my feelings. Oh, sorry. Delirious. I have my sins create art for the home. <laughs> uh, I'm similar. I also have never, I've never like settled into a place on The Sims. Like I don't paint the walls. I don't. <laughs> None of that. I just want. I just. I just try to make people fall in love. Me <laughs> too. <laughs> that's all I do. I just create drama. I just create yes. drama for them. Yeah. That's a great foundation for relationships being transactions. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite it is, part. Go yeah. ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go oh, ahead. no, no, no. I, I, I just, my favorite part is also relationships, but like always like starting them and then purposely making them mess up. Because I always like the downfall. Like, what is this breakup happening? I was like, oh, you want to like flirt with the alien? Let's see how this works out. You know, like just, just out of curiosity. <laughs> Trying to woohoo with death. <laughs> do, you, do you die? I've never tried this. So, do you die if you woohoo with death? Do you know? I don't think so. Okay. I just remember doing a thing where you like make them start woohooing and then you like pause and move the bed and then you like you can see them under a cup. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is like how this is like this is like how I like. I mean, I didn't I didn't learn what sex was. I learned what sex was like in a game. <laughs> We're like, like, like woo and then look under the bed, but then like, you know, like the, the sheets move, but then if you pause and like move the bed, the yeah. character models are still underneath the sheets, but they didn't animate sex because there's, there's no animation because you're not supposed to do that. Yeah. So that looks like, like a ball of melted wax, and then Ooh. you can like, pop out, and then like an arm pop out, because that's like what they built the animations for. Wow. But, the, uh, but otherwise, you just see like, like, a, like a brown skinned, like melted, it was really weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure, fine. As <laughs> nightmare fuel. <laughs> well, but yeah, that's so funny because that is so, because uh, I feel like when you, because when you're seeing it under the covers, it really does, I totally fully believe that they're woohooing. You know what I mean? Yeah. But to know that if you just move the bed, you can see that it's just. There's no animation. No animation for it. <laughs> Something that Max, oh sorry, nope. Something that Max brought up earlier was Maple Story, and everyone like, people were like, yeah, giving affirmations from, um, from, from the you know the ether. And I wanted to bring a Maple Story because the idea of gaming and community, being online with thousands, millions of people online, and I just wanted to know your thoughts and your experiences on gaming and community because you be as we were talking about like the RPGs that we mentioned you could buy your or with these fifth generation consoles you could go online you could play yeah. with not just your friend physically but like remotely yeah. so yeah uh, um, I, I wonder if how uh, what Dave's experience has been like if you ever was on voice chat for overwatch but I feel like I'm too scared to ever really interact with fellow gamers but that's because I, I'm worried that like, you know, like, cause, cause my name is a little feminine. My handle is a little feminine. And sometimes like people will be like, your girl. And I'm like, yes, why, why do you ask too scary? You know, so I don't know. It's, it's, I think it's sometimes like being out there with so many anonymous internet masses mm -hmm. as someone with like femi voice, maybe. Like, I wonder what that's like. I just am like, I would rather not engage with that, but sorry, yeah. Toxic. It's so toxic. <laughs> yeah. Like, it, 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 I, do, I do, like, when I played, like, I would play, um, like, I, like, had my headset, um, 
But yeah, oh my God. So like, I've, I think I've been called, I've been called the N-word more times on, the, on, in, on Overwatch oh, than actually in like, any scenario. But like, it's actually pretty, I mean, I don't want to say like it's casual, but it's just like, oh yeah, we still got to work together to win this game. You know, like there's some weird psychology happening there. Um, just, just, just heal me. You know, just like, <laughs> heal me. <laughs> I understand that you hate me, but he'll heal me yeah. also because <laughs> you want to win, right? <laughs> it's very, it's very messy. It's like, oh, little eight-year-old learned some words, and also like you're the support, so I gotta, <laughs> you're the tank, I gotta stay behind you. <laughs> um, but yeah, <laughs> sorry, that that doesn't answer the question. It's just a little tangent. <laughs> no, but yeah, it's like there's like a high because like you know, when I'm playing like an online like video game, there's like a higher tolerance for like what people will say to me online because like. Yeah, people say, like, the most awful things, like, when you're playing, like, an FPS shooter, like, in Power Strike, mm -hmm. it's awful, but still, at the end of the day, it's sort of like, oh, but wait, I need you to, like, you're my team, you gotta help me, <laughs> like, they'll switch from, like, I'll start saying such awful things, like, they'll say such awful things to me, but I'm like, oh, okay, this is natural, this is fine, like, that's okay, you know, I'll take it, like, natural. <laughs> mm -hmm. CA, you got something yeah. to say? No, I don't have much to say, because I, I am actually a very private gamer. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that I play video games and they're like, wait, what? Because uh, I do it so much on my own time. And I think that if, if I were to do any kind of live playing, it would just be with family. So like I would give my handle to my brothers because they're who, they, they're who I played with my whole life. Mm. So if they were like, let's play, and I would be like, okay, you want to play this game? They'd be like, no, Call of Duty. And I'd be like, okay, I'll learn how to play Call of Duty. <laughs> like, <laughs> it is also that like they're the only people I play with because I know that I wouldn't have to deal with any of that. But also we have very different tastes, so I'd have to adjust, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it has become very much a solo practice for me, even though I invest in sort of consoles and ways of playing that allow me to do live playing, I don't really do it. I even have the headsets. I don't use them. I use them just so that my girlfriend doesn't have to hear the game. <laughs> awesome. No, that's so interesting because, like, I'm now definitely, like, more of like, a private gamer. I usually play, yeah, I'm actually like, more like those kind of games, like, uh, what happened to Edith Finch, like, those kind of games. It's only when I was, like, mm -hmm. way younger, like, with the, like, I played Maple Story, like, when I was, like, eight years old, like, RuneScape and that kind of stuff. Like, RuneScape. I, could, yeah, it was really weird because, like, I didn't have, like, I had like a lot of social anxiety growing up, so I didn't really go out that much. So all of my social interactions were all online, which I think helped me because I couldn't like talk to people in real life, so I just talked to them online. But it's I still am like shocked at how much of my social interaction was on like online with like RuneScape, Maple Story, Mabinagi, or, like Ion stuff like this. Like I like those are, like people I talk to, and I don't even know their real names. I have no idea who they are, but those mm -hmm. are my communities that I grew up on. And it's weird because like that's like me being a child of these online worlds because I didn't have that. Those are all my community. That but that was like the majority of my social interactions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I mean like playing playing with my sister too. Like like CA like like playing with your family member and then like in my case like sitting next to my sister while holding the you know like PlayStation thing like is sort of like local multiplayer that's what it is local multiplayer i feel like have always been my favorite thing because i feel like i don't have to i don't have all the responsibility right and because my sister's a better gamer she'll usually carry me <laughs> so i'll just like i'll just like yay but but because of that i've played some horrible games just for the local multiplayer part of it like gears of war like i've played oh. gears of war which is horrible <laughs> It's just, it's just, you just shoot. Like, that's your, that's the whole game. Like, the title, <laughs> like, listen to the title, Gears of War. Like, that is, <laughs> it's, it's, it's like one of those, it's the most, like, macho shit in the world. And, like, I, and, like, I used to play with Winnie, my sister, because um, local multiplayer, there's so few multi local multiplayers that are available right now, but I grew up playing, you know, you know, ha letting my sister carry me through so many missions, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Um, there are two things that I would love to throw in um, before we transition into questions. And those who are watching, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A box and we'll go through them. We're stoked to get uh, to, to answer what you would like to know. Um, so uh, going back to the beginning of the pandemic, game consoles were flying off the shelves. 
I don't know how my brother got a Switch, but somehow got one. <laughs> and just like everyone played uh, and is still playing Animal Crossing, um, I'm somewhat bitter and I will out him right here because he deleted my file because he did not want me to be on the same island as he is. Yeah, he's on record. I know. Dude, <laughs> That's cold. But, <laughs> but it's okay. I found community through a game called The Under, which is actually on the Oculus, and it's made by a theater company in New York called Pie Hole, and uh, mm. and a game company in Cali called Tenderclaw, and you meet people from across the world, and you can't talk, and you just see these like you are like this geometric figure and you have the way you communicate to people is to physically move your arms and your head and it's an open world game and actually through it they div you have live actors come on as avatars and they're the only ones who could speak and so you are actually interacting with actors who create scenarios and things and they even did a production of the tempest over the summer hmm. which i have to say oh, like made me cry the first time i did it because in the game, you actually physically walk to in, in the VR world to a, a booth, a ticket booth. You buy a ticket and you, they put you in a lobby. And while you're waiting in this lobby, you do magic and you try to solve the riddles and you're picking things up. But um, the reason why I brought that up is have you seen or experienced anything, especially during this pandemic? I feel a lot of theater has moved to this gaming world like i like if you go to new york theater workshops ig at some point there is there are recreations of our shows via animal crossing and yeah. so <laughs> yeah i don't know if any of you have experienced like m during the uh, during the quarantine something of uh, the synthesis this like direct synthesis of theater and gaming um I don't know if it was a synthesis at all, but I just played a lot of Animal Crossing and that was my way of leaving the house and like walking around in nature and like shaking trees, mm -hmm. you know? And fishing and fishing. And fishing, yeah. Mm -hmm. And also like, I think I play, started to play Overwatch very, a lot more regularly. I started to play like every night because I was like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't got nothing else to do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't got events to go to, so I will just... <laughs> work on my SR. So SR is uh, season rating. Yes. It's a score. I'm very low. <laughs> I, my height was gold, Dave, if okay. that means anything to you. What are you at? Did you get to like platinum and stuff? I got to low diamond. <gasps> oh, wow. oh, so cool. That's You're so no, cool, Dave. No, like, this, this is a recruitment time. Is. This is when you recruit. <laughs> that was you like, carry me. <laughs> that was like, I, like, I, like also, in the beginning of the pandemic was like like I played like a lot of Apex, and that was that was when I was like, oh, am I okay? And I wasn't, but, <laughs> but like I needed, I like it, it 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 got me through like both like the last couple months of grad school and also the beginning months of pandemic. <laughs> so it was not as simple as a theater, and uh, but it did. I don't even want to say it filled the void; it complemented the void. Mm -hmm. it, was another void. it was a separate void. It was two voids next to each other that just like when they combined, became a Neutron star. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to echo that. <laughs> yeah. I just feel like that's true. I, feel, I like, I actually am in a bit of a renaissance as a gamer because I played so intensely in my youth. And then a few years ago, I sold my consoles because I had an N64. I had... I just got rid of it all because I was like, I'm supposed to be writing plays, CA write. And so I was like, I don't have the brain space to write plays and play games. And then like once the pandemic hit, like the only thing that made me feel normal was going back to my games. Like, I mean, I haven't played The Sims since I was probably a teenager. Like I was playing other stuff in later years, but like it's what I've come back to for some reason because there's a weird safety and nostalgia in it. Hmm. Um, but also I found all like I played, I spent, there was, Maybe the early pandemic, I spent two weeks just going through Ori and the Blind Forest and Ori and the Will of the Wisps, um, which I played like a psycho. I just like couldn't do anything else. And it's a puzzle game that like when you reach 
certain levels of it, there's a really developed story being told about these like beasts, these animals that are all connected in this really lovely story. And I mean, like, it's beautifully done. All the graphics are insane. And I'm crying because the little spidery looking thing loves the little ghost looking thing. Like, <laughs> and I think I just needed to feel deep emotions. And like, that's what the theater is. The theater is like big, big emotions. And I just come off a play where I was in, I was watching previews. I was going every night. Every night I was watching actors like yell at each other. And I was like, I need some of that. But now I'm gonna do it with this spider thing and this little ghost thing. There is a, there's like a, a symmetry there. That's not the same, but um, it feels more tangible than just like sitting back and like watching something. Yeah, I just feel exactly like the same way as CA. Like. I also that same thing of like, you know, I'm an adult now or I'm a writer. I, you know, I, don't, I can't waste my time doing games, but only recently, yeah, I guess I, I'll say it that, like I'm now in a renaissance of gaming. And yeah, that's exactly how I feel. Cause like, I think the majority of my gaming is definitely in my youth. Like, yeah, as like a kid, like, yeah, I'm still shocked how much I spent just playing the games. Oh, this is excellent. Before we move on to to the questions and we have a ton of questions um so we're we're, we're gonna have fun with this um dave just want to throw in for during grad school and also everyone for have a good laugh for me to like get away from grad school as i was writing my thesis on queer futurity on the stage <laughs> um yeah i played dream daddy if anyone out there has oh, dream daddy, oh my. i know about dream daddy i know Girl, I've been single for so long. All I got is Dream Daddy. It's all good. Dream, do you guys, do we all know what Dream Daddy is? Dream, Dream I Daddy. don't. Dream Daddy, no, Dream, Daddy. Dream, Daddy, Dream Daddy is a, a dating game where you have many, many options of dreamy daddies. Yes. And they're all unified by their ideas identifying as a daddy and that's it but literally and as dads like they're just dads. dads they're fathers yeah and then you just <laughs> just date them and they're queer and they're all different shapes and sizes there's a bear there's an athletic guy there's like a nerdy guy it's like like it's it's a vampire it's wonderful um <laughs> there's many people to but game grumps that's the first uh, game that game grumps made which is very interesting but yes, if you have time, Dream Daddy, does it's not sponsoring this. this. No, <laughs> it should. <laughs> Dream Daddy. Um, oh, so let's go through uh, questions. We have a <laughs> we we're getting a lot of great comments about Dream Daddy right now. <laughs> um, so uh, let me see. Oh, um, so this is from Alan Hahn the shared experience of theater is such a big part of its power. I suppose the same goes for MMO, um, MMPO, um, ORGs. What have you, what has been, been your most powerful experience as an individual and have you wished you could have shared that experience? Um, I'll, I'll start. I feel like uh, I am actually a big esports fan in general. So I, used to go to the stadium when I was in LA. Um, it's, uh, uh, I used to go to like a full stadium where we just would go and I would cheer on the New York team, New York, New York Excelsior. Um, and it literally would be six Korean guys, who would like just children, just children, not even guys, like children, like just, uh, just, just 18 to like 21 Korean children they will just show up with their keyboard and their mouse and they will like set it up and they would just like sit there and they would just, um, uh, they would play, they play Overwatch. And uh, the feel like um, as I was sort of looking around, it just, I don't know, I feel like that was a very special community thing <laughs> because we were the very weird group of people who like were following this league, you know, <laughs> as though it's a real, you know, anyway, yeah. I guess think. That's the end of my story. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> this is going to be so silly. Yeah. When I was seven years old, yeah. for me, the hardest game in the world at that point was The Lion King on Sega <gasps> Genesis. It's hard. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Okay. It's hard. So, I re so as an individual player, I remember being seven 
and the there is they do the I just can't wait to be king scene and it's so it's a basically a puzzle and time so you try to get across the the Sahara and you're trying to just use all these monkeys that are throwing you back and forth but you have to remember the pattern and I just remember I finally made it to the end of the level and that was a moment I wish I shared with people because uh, you know looking back the amount of time and investment that goes into it and the problem solving I was so proud of myself <laughs> at seven I was like I did it and there was just a, a kick-ass soundtrack to it. So it just felt like this, <laughs> like a monumental moment for me. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll say Portal 2. Mm. Um, that little like chorus thing with the things oh. and the... Uh, oh, sorry. sorry. Sorry, no spoilers. No. Spoiler, yeah. spoiler. I didn't say too much. I didn't say too much. I didn't say too much. It, I, that does not explain it. It's so much bigger than that. <laughs> But it, it's a, it felt transcendent. Mm -hmm. It truly felt transcendent and I was experiencing it alone and I was like, nobody is here to hear this music with me. And yeah. I like, I, I felt so accomplished because that's one of my favorite uh, sort of puzzle-like games that I've ever played. And it really required me to like find spatial logic that is not my strength mm -hmm. um, to get through it. And I just felt so good. And I really wanted somebody there to be like, did you see how hard I worked? <laughs> we did it, but I did it by myself and it was a little sad. <laughs> um, my, my sister, sorry, one thing about literally that moment that we're talking about that we're not spoiling people on, but that moment is uh, literally uh, the topic of the academic little paper, analysis paper that my sister wrote to get into Game Center as an MFA. <laughs> like literally it is that thing, the transcendent that thing yeah mm -hmm. so i feel like it's amazing that they're like it's not just like one person who feels that it's like everybody who, you know yeah mm -hmm. everybody but at least you yeah. i i when i was um King, kingdom Hearts is probably one of the other franchises that's like very close to my heart and like they're um the i think the ending of the first kingdom hearts i think kingdom hearts has like the best soundtrack of, like i want that music to play at my wedding um and like, <laughs> They, and I, I beat, like, I had woken up before, like, really early before school one day to beat it, um, and, like, the ending music played, and it's, like, this, like, crazy cinematic. The story makes no goddamn sense, but it just, like, makes you feel shit, but it's just, like, Goofy and Donald and Final Fantasy characters, um, and, like, I don't know what, it was also just, like, very early in the morning, just, like, a lot of things happened at one time together next to a soundtrack that, like, I just like I just like wept and then I went to school um and that was that got me that's when I was like oh I am feeling things <laughs> this is the most like basic thing ever but in RuneScape I was like seven years old I was in the suit I was in the sewer for some reason like fighting rats whatever and I'll never forget I found like just 10,000 gold just like lying there just like it was just there along with like a lot of other stuff like like a bunch of rune weapons and I just took it and yeah th there was no power there was no skill of that I just took it but I remember I just felt like I got away with murder and I just <laughs> went to school I remember I was like I just cannot stop thinking about that at school and I told everyone and my friend was like what what <laughs> there's so much grinding in that game too that's like... yeah dude it's, yeah chopping those trees cooking that meat <laughs> <laughs> trying to get some lobsters <laughs> <laughs> So we have a question from Michael Glassmacher. Um, do you see a place for more interactivity in live theater? If so, how? Do you think there is a point where it will become something else beyond theater? Um, sorry, what, what do you think uh, is it will, what will become something else? Do you mean like the um, interactivity? Yeah. Got it, yeah. Um, I feel like I feel like this is one of those things where like the definition becomes very the key to answering this question. Where I feel like uh, the medium itself is so different. I wonder if we start involving more interactivity to theater. First of all, that's not the kind of theater that I would I would personally like to make because I'm a control freak, right? And like a, have a full god complex as a writer so <laughs> i wouldn't want that much interaction that much um like actual literal interactivity mm -hmm. from the audience 
this in theater because then I feel like then then we're trying to make something else. I don't know. That's me. I think um, I think the only thing that comes to mind, and this isn't quite interactivity, but I thought it was a way to pull from gaming that was interesting. Uh, Feifu at mm. yeah. theater for a new audience, the little moment when she's beneath the glass and everybody's in headphones. That felt. Um, Oh, Brittany was great in that. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, she was amazing. And it, it felt like you were having a private experience that was shared. There was something about it that felt like gaming when everybody's in headsets and talking. Mm. Um, and I like once went to one of those sort of like gaming centers in LA where like you go to like one little sector of Los Angeles and there are like gaming rooms where you go in and you put in headsets and everybody's playing individual games, but you're all in a room together. And it felt like that, even though we were having a shared experience, that shared experience had been made private and made personal in a way that gaming is. And that was actually, I thought, amazing. It was nice to be looking down and then like glance at my girlfriend and then glance at this director I know and be like, theater, huh? <laughs> like there was like, do do do. <laughs> like there was, it was like, sometimes I, that kind of stuff happens and I'm like, this is stupid. But that time I was like, this is actually interesting. And it's saying something about intimacy and madness and like, I'm in. Mm -hmm. And like, if we can find smart ways to do it, sure. But if we're just doing games for game's sake, like I'm not interested in that. Like it just should be on theme and on story actually. Um, yeah. Look, probably like argue, it's probably arguably like already happening. It's just like not on like theater stages, you know, yes. which right. and like just leans point goes to like what the definition is. Like I like I like what there's this play called like the Seven Killings of Kylie Jenner that just like is I mean that's about gaming is more about sort of, like meme culture <laughs> on stage where like yeah it's this play it was up at the Royal Court right, and um, <laughs> that was like, was amazing they just like they become um, they become like memes to as the play mm -hmm. progresses um, and like every instead of like emotions they just become like like different <clears throat> at the time um, in a way where it was like okay cool that's like we're seeing something. A, like tech tech a sort of like tech, technology and like cultural influence like on a mainstream stage so like that's maybe like where the clash happens but i feel like it's sort of like integration between the two is probably happening right now just not in mm. those spaces it also feels okay because i feel like kind of stubborn about what theater is <laughs> yeah the first thing i thought of was this thing this play called pay up by pig iron theater it's like, I don't even know if it's even theater at all, but like, yeah, it's basically like the, you, you have your ticket, which is like 10 bucks or something like that. And I remember you, like, you see a scene, it's like, you know, oh, you have $10, but like each scene is like two or $3 and you could choose, you know, you can't see all the scenes, but you could choose, you know, I'm going to pay to watch this scene for like $3. And also like the scenes they have in there, the play is like really, really weird. Like they have a box on their head and I even speaking of wear headphones on, but yeah, because they're kind of like, I don't know where I can see more interactivity, but seeing more intentionality and like revealing like the fact that oh you like like see i just put really beautifully so, you know you're paying to see people lie <laughs> like more more intention <laughs> revealing that that in our choices that's that's what i would like to see i think for me where i see a lot of like gaming or conventions of gaming that come in is like immersive theater i don't know how that will look like post covid but it you know like I, I it's so funny it was like I am a person Celine you'll never come with me to it like I don't think you'll like the immersive theater that I go to <laughs> <laughs> because a, um, there is a company in New York called Third Rail and they actually do shows throughout the country mm -hmm. and um, I I think it was called the Grand Paradise someone correct me in the chat but um, it, they took a warehouse in Brooklyn changed it into they filled it with sand made different sets and changed it into this um into this resort and you're thrusted in and uh, into this space your ticket is an airplane an airplane ticket they show you like keep your hands and arms in they greet you they put lays on you and then they start a ritual and throughout the three hours so basically they found the fountain of youth and then they f they put you in these like situations in which you decide where to go and for me that like in my head that's my experience of playing like you know, an open world game. Like you choose where to go and you have these, you decide with which character you build or like a relationship with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's into, uh, yeah, I'm totally into that. Come with me. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah. Uh, 
I have another question. Um, I love all of your thoughts. Oh, this is from Madeline Paquette. I love all your thoughts on games as performance spaces. I'm thinking of things like Among Us. I'm addicted to that game. Or yo, even, yo, same, same. <laughs> <laughs> or even the talk show that is hosted on Animal Crossing. What do you think are the possibilities there? Isn't that like you and the Sims now? <laughs> yeah, I think that's, yeah, I think that's what it is. I think that's what the piece that I make, I'm going to make in a couple of weeks is. I think that's just really what's, what it's going to be. Like, I'm, it, we may learn that games are not good performance spaces, right? At this, at this thing. <laughs> we might, you might watch me for two nights and be like, wow, games are really not good spaces for performance. But is that or, yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah. no, 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 keep going. I was going to ask a, a, like, a weird follow-up question. But yeah. like, is the performance is watching you? Because yeah. it's like your yeah. yeah, in yeah. Let's Play, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I feel like the thing that I've been uh, uh, working as, as hard as I could on uh, with, with regards to the seagull on The Sims 4 it has been um, making sure that the expectations are managed for people who do not fully know, who haven't really watched Let's Plays. You know, because Let's Plays, let's be real, are like, you know, so much of it is just like watching me literally like try to figure something out. So it's like, it's just not going to be a complete performance as one we might uh, be used to in theater, where people have been rehearsing those lines and those moments like, you know, hundreds of times. Like, it's, it's basically the first time that you'll be making the thing, I'll be making the thing, and the last time. And it will just be a all kinds of uh, work in progress in between. Yeah. We have time uh, for uh, one more question. And let me see. Uh -huh. I like this because it gives a nice little throwback to the history of RPGs on in gaming. Are any of you uh, Dungeons and Dragons players? Fantasy games, Dragon Age, Elder Scrolls, etc., involve a lot of interaction between players and the game master, dungeon master. Do you think this would be a great way to do improv and interactive theater? Um, I, I played Mass Effect and Dragon Age. Maybe I didn't. I never played Mass Effect, but I watched people play Mass Effect, and I played uh, Dragon Age. Um, I feel like I played it like Dream Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry, this doesn't mean anything. But I think that what I mean is like, I feel like I wonder about like, um, I I'm, I'm always wary of like uh, combining just how much control I want to have in theater mm -hmm. and the thing that the audience sees versus giving the, the players slash audience so much freedom because in games i feel like more freedom the better almost with like specific rules but in theater it's literally like sit there and then like watch me show you things and you can interact but only through like laughter yeah. clap, right like you can heckle a little but like yeah i don't know what do you guys think i i, I would yeah if, sorry oh no you got it go ahead Oh, I would find it fascinating. So one of my friend, uh, a friend of mine, a playwright friend of mine is also a dungeon master. And he is going through this conundrum of like how to create like these arcs and these stories with people who are essentially improv and creating their character at that moment. Mm -hmm. And for me, like if, if I, it's, if I watch that live, that's the theatrical experience of, which is similar to a let's play. Mm -hmm. Like I'm truly just watching that person problem solve and be creative at that moment in the moment of creation and I think that's so fascinating yeah yeah, yeah. I guess it all I mean it's like the it's just like the art the role playing and RPG kind of just I, I, I had one of my friends had like a murder mystery birthday recently that like was the similar thing of just like improv take adopting a persona that was like very much in the realm of like <laughs> Dragon Age Elder Scrolls type situation um and yeah, I mean, it was all it was all kind of that sort of like uh, randomly generated, but like within sort of like provided parameters of like you're this character, you speak this way, you want to interact with this person, you have a crush on this person, now play, you know. Um, I love Dragon Age so much. <laughs> Dragon Age is so good. Bioware was true. like 
<laughs> yeah. I I guess before we end tonight, um, is there a game or that you would all suggest people to play? It, it doesn't need to be a new game. It could be a good oldie, something that you know people should explore. Okay, I know exactly. Like everyone needs to play Hotline Miami. Hotline Miami oh. one and two. Oh my god! Like it, I mean, it's not even expensive. It's like an it's like a really really interesting indie game, and it it's very it's actually all similar to what Dave was talking about about um uh, it makes you question violence. Like I see that's like a trend of like video games like more like in the past ten years of like questioning like what you're doing in a game and making you like. Yeah, I, I won't really say much, but I'm just saying it has to do a lot with violence, and it's making you question that. But yeah, it's great. It's pixel art, and it's kind of like it has like the dopest soundtrack ever. Yeah, Hotline Miami. I think Breath of the Wild is like a really good like if you want to get like swept up in like the majesty of something. Um, uh, that's like a good starting place. The one that's been I like I've been getting my ass kicked by Sekiro recently, um, and like that's. And like I love it. Like I've been like really seeking that out in games more. So I think like anything that's sort of like the Dark Souls genre um, is mm. will either make you like love it or you'll be like I'm never gonna play a video game again. <laughs> <laughs> Every time someone mentions Dark Souls, Paris, <laughs> you go you hit that conundrum. Yes. Um, I I feel like I would say Papers, Please which I feel like if someone asked me what the best game ever is, I would say it's Papers, Please. Because um, Papers, Please is incredible because it's like a bureaucratic thriller where you are playing a border guard of an Eastern Bloc, like fictional Eastern Bloc country, and you're doing nothing but looking at passports and trying to see if this person, it's legal for this person to pass into the country. So you, your, uh, your user interface is just your little booth where someone just like passes you the passport and you just look at literally like expiry dates and stuff like that to see if your documents are uh, legit. And if it is, you only have real one interaction, which is you approve their entry or you do not approve their entry. But what's amazing is with it so much, um, so much storytelling happens in it. It's, I think it's more of a, it's like an eight bit kind of like the aesthetic is almost like a little bit. Yeah, it's really incredible. I think yeah, I think I love it. Yeah. Uh, I'll say a game I played recently. There's so many answers to this, so I'll just say the game I played recently that has stuck with me the most. Um, this is a game called Tacoma. Um, it's a pretty simple one. You like are sent to a spaceship to collect data, but you know a lot of people died there and you're just spending your time trying to collect that data and in doing so solve the mystery of what happened. Um, and when I got to the end, it's so short. It's not a massive investment of time um, and it really moved me. <laughs> um, and I like games that are quick like that, that I can play again and not be bored by because there are things you can miss because there's so many rooms and so many little bits of information. You can play it a few times and I've really, really, really enjoyed it. I guess uh, my my offering is a game that I love. It's called This War of Mine. It's a point and click survivor, tactical, and the the developers purposely created the game so that people have a sense of what their families had gone through in the war, so that it would stop, like so that there would be no war. Um, it's quite moving. I've also cried with that, thinking about my choices and not knowing. Um, essentially, you are in a war zone. And you don't know when the war will end. So there are days in which you have to make choices of, will I have to eat today? Or do I save it for my kid who can't help me? Like, or do I leave my child and I have to go out in the middle of the night to scavenge for food? And do I kill this person for the food? It's wild. But um, it's one of the games like, that just makes you think and stop. Um, yeah. I I'm so bad at that game, but I recognize its beauty. But mm -hmm. I... I feel like I die, like day three. <laughs> like all my characters it's die. Tough. Yeah, it's, so it's tough. Dude, no. it's, it's so like it's so rough to scavenge because it's it's so bleak. That game is so bleak. Yeah, it it makes you really anti-war. 
as if yeah. I wasn't anti-war before. <laughs> 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 I was like, this war is bad, you guys. Like, it was like... <laughs> <laughs> but I have to say, this is so grand, speaking with um, amazing theater artists, amazing playwrights who are also amazing gamers, and we all love different kind of games. And so I learned a lot about each other. This is great. <laughs> and I just want to take time to thank you all for being on this panel and thank you and the audience for sending in your questions. And also, you still have time. Please give generously to Broadway for Racial Justice. And I just want to do some plugs. Um, next Wednesday, October 21st at 6.30 p.m., we have a talk with What the Constitution Means to Me's Heidi Schreck, which is now available on Amazon Prime. Um, <laughs> Also, uh, next Thursday, we have an open mic night with Poetic Theater Productions, and we have um, awesome performers from all over the country joining in every month. And on Wednesday, October 10th p.m., we have a talk with the Dominican Artist Collective in advance of their Artistic Instigator Project. And if you want of upcoming programming at ncw.org, um, and all past masterclasses of Fireside Chats, they're available for viewing at nytw.org. Awesome. And um, just a shout out, thank you so much, Celine. Your project, um, Chekhov's the Seagull on Sims 4 um, on Twitch, <laughs> is on October 27th and 28th. Um, it's split into two, the four acts are split into two parts. So on the 27th, one and two. And on the 28th, three and four. And you could find more information on our website. And it's free. So please come send like I'm excited for this exploration. It's gonna be great. It's gonna be really fun. Yeah. And we're gonna have uh, some some surprise calls from friends. And so it's gonna be it's gonna be wonderful. So okay. um, friends, uh, we're gonna post a link to a short survey about class or uh, today's uh, conversation in the comments on Zoom and Facebook. Please take a moment to share your thoughts with us. Um, and I guess till next time. <laughs> yeah, I got, got, got. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> thank yeah, you. Thank you. I, you guys you. Are, oh, I know, but you just feel so bonded by just our love. Like, <laughs> yes. The fact that like everybody yeah. knew every single one of these games like of mm -hmm. each other. Like sometimes you'd be like, oh, I've never heard of. I I don't know about that one, but we still like, I, like I I just I'm so amazed that like like CA is like Tacoma, and I'm like, oh my god, a yeah. gem. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like that you're just like that like you just you can say it in most spaces and people will be like, what? But like it's like in this room we're like oh, portal two and you're like portal. Two. <laughs> Apex, Apex Legends and we're like, we know what that is, you know. So, you know, so there's such bonding that's going on, you know what I mean? I don't know. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, right. everyone. Bye friends. Bye. Bye. Bye internet. Bye. Bye. <laughs>